The Guide to the Camarilla writes, The Camarilla does not exist to protect humanity from vampiric depredation. Rather, its function is to ensure the safest and most profitable existence possible for its members. And while it may exist to the profit of the elders who run the show, it does often offer something few other sects do, security and education for the newly embraced. If they're willing to roll over and do what they're told, the resources, knowledge and machinations of the Camarilla can offer a safe port in a storm while the fledging kindred builds power and understanding of their new nature. However, there's quite a few things a vampire must know before they are to be considered an adult in kindred society. The Camarilla hasn't survived for over 500 years thanks to loose reins, after all. Understanding your own vampiric nature is one thing, but the traditions, the Camarilla laws, and your ability to work within their boundaries are inevitably the rod by which you will be measured when you first start mingling with the undead. The Masquerade The Masquerade is the single most important law of the Camarilla, but even Anarchs and the Sabbat recognize the value of having the mortals think you are not real, even if they are often more casual about towing the line or outright breaking it. Breaching this tradition can easily earn you final death if the prince considers your misstep severe enough. Depending on how the prince interprets it, and how much of a hard ass they might be, a violation may range from using your more obvious vampiric powers in the presence of mortals, to simply having human friends. As this tradition came to be because of the First Inquisition, an event that resulted in the death of many powerful vampires as the kind rose up against the kindred, quite a few elders who are still around from back then do not take kindly to someone who risks a repetition of that. And living in a modern world with smartphones, social media, drones and the like, it has never been more important to ensure that the world learns as little about your kind as possible. The St. Louis Conclave of 95 also declared it a potential breach to deal with other supernatural beings, and gives a prince free reign to enforce their rules should they see fit. Not that most supernaturals want anything to do with vampires. The Domain your domain is what territory you can claim as yours, as long as you can defend it. Princes will have entire cities as their domain, granted to them in a show of faith from the local clans through praxis. But it is often understood that certain areas are to belong to certain clans. A prince who starts giving away territory in the sewers to those outside of Clan Osferatu might quickly find that the support from them will wither, potentially even turning to active opposition. If the prince let the elders have their own domain, and serving as an arbiter in affairs that need it, they will usually police their own just fine and show the prince more respect than if they were meddling in their affairs and micromanaging. It used to be that a kindred was in the right to kill you if you hunted in their territory. But these days, many cities are so crowded that there are plenty of communal grounds where kindred, especially younger ones, can get their fill. It helps that mortals tend to find the feeding quite pleasurable and don't usually have a good recollection of what happened during the kiss. Vampires can also lick the wounds closed, erasing any obvious evidence of their feeding. The Tradition of Progeny It is common that a kindred would need their prince's permission to embrace and this stems from how the prince is the ruler of a city and needs to ensure that the vampiric population does not grow big enough to threaten the masquerade, nor that any particular faction becomes too powerful. And in fact, if someone is found to embrace without permission, both sire and child may be expelled or even destroyed, should the prince see fit. The prince is free to embrace however much they want, a luxury that comes with the title, but if they do it too much while simultaneously restricting the other's right to, it can easily become a point of conflict with the city's elders, as nothing will alienate the primogen faster than being outbred, as it were, by the one whose power they are supposedly balancing. The Tradition of Accounting This tradition varies across the world, and some exceptionally powerful princes may even hold the primogen responsible should someone of their clan break the tradition. But more often this means that a sire is responsible for all of their child's actions until said child is acknowledged as a proper kindred, which is something only the city's prince may do. This acknowledgement can play out in many different ways, depending usually on the prince, but knowing the traditions and their implications is most certainly always a constant. The Tradition of Hospitality if you're a new arrival to a city, politeness dictates that you make your presence known to the vampire in charge of that domain. The Prince. How this is to be done is usually up to the Prince themselves, who might for example use this as an opportunity to embarrass the new arrival by making some outrageous demand. 
Generally, it is in most vampires' interest that the prince knows how many kindred are in their city in order to prevent potential masquerade breaches or other unfortunate accidents. If a vampire decides not to make their presence known, they're playing a dangerous game. In fact, if the prince is powerful enough, they may choose to invoke the second tradition on the trespassers. Even if they don't, an unknown vampire may be mistaken for an agent of the Sabbat, or the Anarchs, and may therefore be destroyed because of it. Of course, certain kindred are so powerful that they don't consider the local prince important enough to drop by, and a smart prince is wise enough to let that slide. The Tradition of Destruction Many argue that this tradition actually means that any sire has the right to destroy their progeny should they see fit. But in many cities, it is instead that the prince bears this right, the right having been lost to the sire once the child was presented to them. The prince also has the power to sentence another kindred to the blood hunt, a citywide death sentence allowing any kindred the right to kill and even drain the target of a hunt, an act otherwise strictly prohibited. Of course, should a blood hunt be called on a vampire of great power, it may instead backfire on the prince, who will be perceived as weak and foolhardy. Calling the blood hunt also gives elder vampires the opportunity to pick the corpse clean, so to speak, and if a prince does it too often, the kindred of the city might come to expect it, influencing his decisions and demanding it be done more often. After all, if the prince sentences you, your assets will be free for the taking. And finally, you have the clans. While I will cover each of them more in detail in future videos, here is a quick rundown of the seven founders of the Camarilla. Bruja, the rabble, also known as the scholars. If there is a cause to rebel against, the Bruja will find it and fight it feverishly, and their clan is known for their fierce temper and a deeply ingrained disdain for authority. A Bruja will rally to a cause, but oftentimes not the same as the others, leading to in-clan squabbling. The Gangrel are feral loners, and one of the few clans to travel frequently, earning them the nickname Outlanders. They, more than other clans, have a strong affinity for animals, oftentimes taking on animalistic traits of their own. The Gangrel have little patience for politics and machinations, and try to avoid getting dragged into the petty schemes of the other clans. The Malkavians, aptly called the Lunatics, are all mad, one way or another. Mad prophets, these kindreds are often mysterious and hard to decipher, even harder to understand. They are masters of warping the minds of others, at one point even all simultaneously learning a new discipline specifically for it, later on unlearning it just as quick, a mystery even to themselves. The Nosferatu are walking breaches of the masquerade, all twisted and ruined on the outside. But thankfully, these information gatherers have learned to hide in plain sight, and their loyalty to their clan and oftentimes frank and utilitarian outlook on undeath, makes these sewer rats somewhat sympathetic. But if you have a secret, chances are they know it already. The Toreador are the artistes and socialites of the Camarilla, holding lavish parties and pursuing aesthetics above all else. The degenerates love to embrace artists, trying to hold on to the passion and zeal of the human spirit in non-life. Their talent for politics is not to be underestimated, however, and they often rival the Ventru in the amount of princes they have in their clan. The Tremere are one of the few clans capable of wielding magic, using blood, theirs and others, in a myriad of arcane ways. They were once known as the Usurpers, who stole their vampirism, but are now known as the Warlocks, and they are strong supporters of the Camarilla. Hierarchy and structure are key words for this clan, and they are loyal ultimately, only to themselves. The Ventru are the self-styled leaders of the Camarilla, favoring politics and business. It would not be a lie to say that the Camarilla has survived this long only thanks to the hard work of this clan, something which the Blue Bloods take great pride in. Ventru are often at odds with the Bruja due to their vastly different worldviews. The Camarilla was forged by these seven clans and remains, up to this day, the single largest sect. Depending on when your game is set, however, some of the original clans may have left and others might have joined. There will, of course, always be anti-tribu, those who rebel against their clan and join another sect. In future videos, we will cover more aspects of the Camarilla, but join me next time, where I'll be talking about Clan Toreador more in depth. Thank you very much for watching, and be safe out there. Gehenna will soon be upon us.